Okay, great. Uh, so today I'll be talking about how we can summarize our data as a pre-processing step before running our approximate Bayesian inference algorithms in order to get methods that are fast but also have theoretical guarantees on the quantities that practitioners are interested in at the end of the day. So this is work with my uh, graduated postdoc, uh, Trevor Campbell, he's now faculty at the University of British Columbia, and my graduated PhD student, Jonathan Huggins, who's now a postdoc at Harvard Biostats. So somehow the intuition in what we're thinking about this morning is that we can have redundancy in data, even if that data isn't traditionally tall. Like it has a ton of data points, and it's really boring and low dimensional. So just as a, a cartoon, imagine that I have a bunch of text data, um, and maybe they're all articles, about uh, sports. Um, and of course, text data is very interesting, uh, and there's a lot going on in it, and it's very high dimensional. And we as humans can only see in two dimensions, and so my cartoon is, is two dimensional. But imagine that it's more complex. Um, and maybe I have a ton of articles about football. Think of football as the, the international version, soccer, you know, everybody's really interested in it. Um, and so there's lots of articles, and maybe um, at least at the moment, curling is a less popular sport. Um, and so maybe there are fewer curling articles. Um, and I might say to myself, oh, I really want to run my algorithm on this, pretend it's a giant data set up here. Um, and so maybe what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to say, hey, a lot of these articles are pretty redundant. You know, maybe I could replace a lot of similar football articles with one representative curling article, and I could just give it a high weight because maybe there were so many football articles that I started with there. And similarly, I could replace a bunch of curling articles with a representative curling article, and I'll just give it a lower weight because there weren't so many curling articles to begin with. Now, I think the non-controversial thing here is that if I run my algorithm on a handful of data points, it's going to be super fast. And of course, the question that we want to ask is, is it also going to be good? Is it going to be useful? So this idea of pre-processing data to get a smaller weighted data set before running any kind of algorithm, in particular, um, certain types of algorithms uh, is an idea that originated in the theoretical computer science uh, and computational geometry literature. And I think what's really exciting about that literature is that they were able to get theoretical guarantees that if I ran on this smaller data set, if it was chosen carefully, I could get close to my results on the full data set. Now, what's interesting is that this literature, you know, of course, is focused on particular types of problems and particular things like k-means and minimum bounding box problems. And if we think about the types of things that we want to do in Bayesian inference, that's actually quite a larger diversity of problems. We really care about um, you know, many different types of regression, hierarchical regression, many different types of classification, uh, different types of unsupervised learning that can get way beyond k-means clustering. And in particular, we want to be able to deal with all of these very easily, very automatically, without coming up with a new research paper you know, every time you come up with a new model. Okay, now, we're about to get into to Bayesian inference, um, and I want to point out that you know, people have thought about compressing data in Bayesian inference before. This is going to be obviously a limited list, but some examples are data squashing for uh, logistic regression, Bayesian logistic regression. If anybody's at all worked in Gaussian processes, you're familiar with inducing point methods for scaling those up. So this idea is out there, but it's really been heuristic in the sense that there aren't these guarantees on the things that people want to report at the end of the day, like point estimates and uncertainties. And that's what we want to get at. Now, of course, if we're thinking about scaling up a giant data set, the first thing that we should think about is uniform subsampling. This can be extremely useful in practice, not to mention that we should kind of always try the simplest thing because sometimes it's really the most powerful thing. And we're going to point out that there are some issues with uniform subsampling, but just to get us into that discussion, let me start by imagining what goes on with this data set up here. You know, maybe I'm working for a curling manufacturer, and they want me to analyze their sports text data, and I say, oh, well, first I'm going to uniform subsample it because there's so much of it. And so I do that, and oops, I lost all the curling data. Now, maybe you're not super concerned about what happens to this curling manufacturer, um, but you can imagine that there are cases where this might really matter. You know, what if I'm interested in a cybersecurity example, and there's a very small but important collection of malicious packets on my network. I don't know what they are in advance, and I definitely don't want to subsample them away. Or if I'm interested in a medical task, it might be that you know, some proportion of people have a really negative reaction to my medicine, my new medicine, I definitely don't want to subsample them away, and I don't know them in advance. Okay, so again, we're going to come back to uniform subsampling, but so far we've talked about this, this high-level idea of what's the core of a data set, 
Going forward, we're going to spend a little time just sort of setting up the Bayesian inference problem, just sort of reminding ourselves what do we really care about from a practitioner's perspective, and what are we trying to accomplish. And then we're going to spend a little bit more time seeing again that uniform subsampling isn't enough, but it's not just uniform subsampling. It's in fact any form of IID subsampling that we're going to have a problem with. We're going to see important sampling sort of fails, and then we're going to turn to optimization as a way to choose uh, these core sets, their weights, and the points associated with them. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the Bayesian setup. What are we trying to accomplish? Um, in order to do that, let's spend a little time thinking about, you know, Bayesian inference has been used in some of the big scientific discoveries of the past few years. Um, so for instance, there was this big exoplanets discovery, seven planets outside of our solar system, around uh, in particular, you know, some other solar system. Um, and Bayesian inference was used to get point estimates and uncertainties for um, potential observations or candidate observations here for the exoplanets. Uh, if we look at the gravitational waves discovery, Bayesian inference was used to get point estimates and uncertainties of the mass and spin of the black hole that was generating the gravitational waves. And so in these cases, we sort of see, you know, scientists care about not just what do we know, but how well do we know? You know, are we sure that this is a, a real phenomenon? Um, it's also really important for decision making. So if we look at an example of analyzing microcredit, uh, so Rachel Meeker is studying this, understanding you know, how much do these small loans to individuals in impoverished areas help actually bring them out of poverty, or do they? And so for that, we really want to get not just point estimates of how much these loans are increasing business profit, but uncertainties as well. Um, if we look at uh, traffic route, so for instance, you're in an ambulance, you really need to get some life-saving procedure, it's really important to not get just a point estimate of how long it's going to take to get to the hospital, but an uncertainty as well to make the best choices. Uh, Hamsa Balakrishnan is going to be talking at the Bayesian Non-Parametrics Workshop uh, at the end of NUREX. Um, she's interested in estimates of how much fuel a plane is using based on publicly available information. And again, not just point estimates, but uncertainties in case we want to make decisions based on that information. Okay, so there's this recurring theme here. We really want to get these point estimates and uncertainties. Things like a Bayesian posterior mean and covariance. That seems to be the thing that people are interested in reporting. And of course, we want to ask, you know, why are we here? What's, what remains to be done in getting these? Well, um, there are sort of some, some issues with existing methods that we're all sort of thinking about implicitly, but let's make them explicit. So I think the first one, the obvious one that we're all thinking is that sometimes existing methods can be slow to run computationally. But I think when we think about speed, it's important to think not just about computational speed, but about user speed. You know, if it takes a biologist, a chemist, an engineer six months to learn about our machine learning methods and then write down equations and then tune some hyperparameters, you know, that contributes to their speed in using these methods. And so we also want to think about, you know, that these methods can be tedious, that they can be user unfriendly. Now, of course, I can easily come up with a method that is extremely fast, in fact, constant time, and has uh, no hyperparameters to tune or anything. That method is I return the number six. It's, it's incredibly fast, as you can you know, see for yourself. I didn't tune any hyperparameters, I didn't have to derive equations, but of course it's useless. Now, this tells us that whenever we think about computing time, you have to simultaneously think about quality. And so we really need methods that are not just fast, but are reliable as well. They're giving the answers that we really care about. Okay, and so what we're going to explore in the talk today is the idea of a summary of data as a way to get at these goals as a way to get at something that's a bit more scalable in terms of computing time, but also automated, that you can just say your prior and likelihood and get an answer ideally, and not have to sort of drive a whole new paper, but also gets error bounds on the posterior quantities that we're really interested in for the finite data that we actually have. Okay, so let's set up a little notation to get a little bit more, more detailed into what is the goal here. Um, so remember, we're doing Bayesian inference, so we have some parameters, some unknown, let's call them theta. <coughs> Uh, we start off with prior, our beliefs about these parameters going into the problem, or lack of knowledge about them. So that's P of theta in our notation here. Let's imagine we pick up some data, let's call it Y. We have a likelihood that relates our data and our parameter, let's call it P of Y given theta. And then finally, Bayes' theorem is just a fact of probability. It says, what do we know after having seen the data? That's the probability of theta given Y. Okay, so just as a, a, a little bit of a toy example to help us visualize what's going on here, let's imagine that we do in fact have a cybersecurity problem. So maybe each of these data points is a website. Some of them are phishing, 
for your personal information, and you would like to decide how those are different from the ones that are perfectly benign, that are not fishing for your personal information. So we imagine each data point, we get maybe some, some covariance XM that tells us about that website for the purposes of this classification problem, and some labels YN, and we'd like to find the classifier that divides these. So that'll be our theta for this particular problem. Now, of course, if we're being Bayesian, we don't just get a point estimate for theta, we get a whole distribution that's a little bit hard to draw here, so let me just draw it over here on the side. This is our posterior, it expresses our knowledge after seeing the data. Now, I want to emphasize, this is a cartoon. The things we're going to do going forward are not specific to classification, they're not specific to, un to supervised learning, they can be for unsupervised learning, but I think this will be informative. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we know at this point that for any moderately complex problem, including something like Bayesian logistic regression, we have to make an approximation. And so one of the 10 most influential algorithms of the 20th century is Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Practitioners love it and it's been very revolutionary because if you run it long enough, you're gonna get the right answer. And of course the problem is that we often don't have until long enough. And so increasingly people are turning to variational bays. So variational bays in general and mean field variational bays is still particularly widely used by practitioners in particular. Uh, because it's fast, we have some work back in 2013 showing we can make it streaming and distributed, and the numbers and speeds are only better since then. But of course the big problem with variational Bayes is that there are some misestimation problems. Now, many of you may be familiar from uh, great textbooks like Murphy and Bishop and, and David Mackay. Um, this classic illustration of if we look at the mean field variational Bayes approximation for this extremely simple two-dimensional problem, that it's pretty bad, you know, the red thing is not great approximation to the green thing. And I think there's this intuition that we all have maybe that, oh, well, the problem is really mean field. That we're optimizing over this really constrained set of distributions. But I, I'd like to argue that's not the case. So we have a, a paper that we recently put on the archive that shows that even if you have quite a small KL divergence, like much smaller than you see in a lot of problems, you can actually get an arbitrarily bad variance estimate and you can get a really bad point estimate. And so somehow there's this issue that actually just having a small KL doesn't translate into these point estimates um, and uncertainties, or at least guarantees on them that we'd like. Okay, so another, another direction again is not just speed, but user speed, sort of speed of use. And so I think a really exciting direction has been these increasing directions for these increasing pu pushes towards automation. So of course, STAN is not the only probabilistic programming language out there. There are great ones, TensorFlow, Edward, you know, many more than I can name right here. Um, but just to point out, in STAN, we have nuts for MCMC and automatic differentiation variational inference for variational inference, in particular, usually mean field variational inference. And, and these are great because they make it so much easier for the practitioner to run. But conversely, they still have all the problems of MCMC in this case and variational inference in this case. And so again, we want something that's got sort of the, the accuracy of MCMC run for a really long time, the, the speed of variational inference, and the automation of something like STAM. Okay, how are we gonna do that? Well, the proposal is let's look at data summarization to help us out. Well, what's that gonna look like? Well, remember there are two ingredients that go into Bayesian inference. There's the prior and the likelihood. And if we're going to sort of squash down the data, why, then that clearly impacts one of these ingredients. It's the likelihood. That's where the data occurs. So let's go a little bit deeper into the likelihood. Now, up to this point, I've been assuming a very general likelihood. Starting from here, I'm going to assume that, in fact, our data are independent, conditional on the underlying parameter. This is still many, many, many models, but it's not all models. I'm not sure that that's actually important to ultimately getting theory like ours, but for the theory that we have, this will be important. So we're gonna make this assumption. Now, once we've made that assumption, we can define a log likelihood for each data point. Let's call it script L sub N. Then the total log likelihood will be the sum over the script L sub N. And now the goal is that we want to approximate this with this core set, this data summarization. And so the, the way we're going to make this is we're going to say, let's assign each data point a weight. So we have weight W1 for data point 1, weight W2 for data point 2, all the way up to weight WN for data point N. And so let's have this big vector W of weights. And we're going to say that the zero norm of W, the number of non-zero elements in W, should be quite small, and certainly much smaller than N, the total size of the data. Okay, so that's sort of the sparsity idea, but of course we don't want it to just be sparse, we want it to be good, and so we create our log likelihood approximation as this sparse sum, sparse again because the Ws are mostly zero, 
And we hope that, in fact, it's quite close to our exact log likelihood. And to express that, we're going to say that if you choose some Hilbert norm between these functions, because remember, these are both functions of theta, that's got to be less than some small epsilon. Now, the theory going forward that I'm going to show you is agnostic to whatever Hilbert norm you might choose. But of course, in practice, you're going to want to choose one, and you're going to want it to have good properties. If you choose a weighted Fisher information distance here, then we can show that you're going to get a bound on the 1 and 2 Wasserstein distance between the approximating and exact posterior. And therefore, you're going to get a bound between the approximating and exact posterior mean, the approximating and exact posterior covariance, the approximating and exact maximum, maximum absolute deviation. So the point estimates and uncertainties, the error on those point estimates and uncertainties that we care about. OK, so at this point, I want to point out that this slide doesn't actually accomplish anything. It's like a wish list. Like, man, wouldn't it be great if there were a corset that did these things? But it definitely doesn't tell you how to make that corset. And so we have to think about, can we make this corset? And if so, how do we do it? And so that's what we're going to do going forward. We're going to see, you know, can we actually accomplish the ideas set out on this slide? OK, so again, the first thing that I think we should think about is, how do we, how do we make this corset? Well, let's try uniform subset. OK, so consider, for instance, our, our toy example from before, and maybe a uniform subsample, and we said, oops, you know, maybe I lost all the fishing data. Um, now, of course, if you had a two-class classification problem, you are not going to subsample away one of your classes. But you can imagine that maybe there are different types of fishing data, and you could have gotten rid of one of those types by accident, and you wouldn't have known that. There's actually a more subtle problem here, which is the following. So imagine this is my data, and I uniformly subsample it, and I upweight it so it's like the whole data set. And I have at least one of each class, and I run my approximate Bayesian inference algorithm on it. Maybe it's MCMC, and I get the whole Bayesian posterior, and here I'm just going to plot the Bayesian posterior mean. So that's what we have in green. And now you do the same thing. You have maybe a different random seed than I do, so you pick out some different data points. You run approximate Bayesian inference on your data set. You put down the approximate posterior mean. And now we have a third friend of ours, because this is the cool thing to do now. They run uniform subsampling. They have a different random seed. They get a different set of data points. They run approximate Bayesian inference. And they just plot the posterior mean. Now, here's the thing that I want you to really be thinking about right now. There is one exact posterior for the full data set. And it has one exact posterior mean. And these are meant to be estimates of that mean. So you don't have to know what that mean is to know that these are bad estimates, because they don't agree with each other. <laughs> OK, so David made the good point that we don't want to just rely on cartoons. We want to actually look at some analyses. Um, and so let's do that. And, and in fact, we see this in, in some actual analyses. So here's 10,000 data points for Bayesian logistic regression problem. We uniformly subsample 10. Those are the black point. <laughs> so we'll have n equals 10. We run approximate Bayesian inference, and we plot the approximate posterior mean in green, and we do this 50 times. And these are the 50 draws you see here. And again, you don't have to know the exact posterior to mean to know that these are bad estimates of it, because they don't even agree with each other even remotely. And this is a pretty simple problem. You would not be happy to get this result if you were just running this once, which would be the whole goal. Now, of course, if we increase the number of uniformly subsampled points, it gets better. But you don't want to uniformly subsample a number of points that's close to your full data set, especially, again, for such a simple problem. We really want to run our approximate you know, MCMC or whatever on 10 data points, because that'll be really fast. OK, so maybe we're thinking to ourselves, hey, maybe the problem here is we know that we actually care about the fishing data. You know, It's pretty important. Maybe we should be using some form of important sampling instead of uniform subsampling. Maybe that's the problem. Well, it turns out that actually we can solve for the optimal importance weights in this case. And we get some theory that will tell us how well we're going to do. So it's high probability bound that we're going to get because we're important sampling. M is the number of points we use to represent our data, sort of this core set. <coughs> this is the core set error in the log likelihood. <coughs> sigma and eta bar have to do with the log likelihood setup, sort of. Sigma is like the scale of the log likelihood, and eta bar has to do with how well aligned the different log likelihoods are. But the main thing I want you to concentrate on here is the square root of m value. So square root of m is nice in the sense that as m, the number of core set points, goes to infinity, this bound goes to 0. It's bad, though, because this is actually just the same rate that we expect from Monte Carlo. It is the Monte Carlo error rate. 
In fact, it's the same rate that we expect from uniform subsample. And we bear that out in practice. So here we again have the same setup we did before, 10,000 data points with red and blue labels, 10 points, important sample now, so they have different weights. We run approximate Bayesian inference on these, MCMC. We um, plot the approximate mean 50 times. We do this 50 times. And again, it's just incredibly noisy, way too noisy for practice. It gets better as we increase the number of points that we import in sample, but again, that's not the point. We'd like to be able to run on 10 data points. That would be very fast. Okay, so let's think to ourselves a little bit what's going wrong here. Well, one way to think about what's going on is once we have set up this Hilbert norm on these log likelihood functions, we can actually think of them like vectors, which is nice. So really what's going on here is we have a bunch of vectors, one for each data point, we're adding them all up to get the total log likelihood in blue. And now we're trying to find a sparse vector sum of the vectors in black to approximate the vector in blue. Now you can make a great corset of size one here. Just take one of these tiny little vectors and give it a really, really high weight. And so now you're gonna have your exact log likelihood, your approximating log likelihood, and it's gonna be great. So why don't we just always import and sample with all of our weight on this vector. Because we're never going to get better than this vector then. There's still some gap. And we want to say, hey, this is the best vector. Let's choose this vector first. And now, for the residual, this is the best vector. Something that approximates the residual is the best vector. And then there's a residual from that, and so on and so forth. We want to be greedy. And so, somehow the problem with any form of IID sampling of these vectors is that we're not considering residual direction. And once we consider residual direction, it really sounds like we're trying to do sparse optimization. To pick out these vectors and pick out their weights. Okay, so nowadays, we hear sparse optimization. I think the thing that comes to mind is Frank Wolf. So let me just remind us all what is Frank Wolf. So Frank Wolf is an algorithm for when we want to perform mm -hmm. convex optimization over a polytope. So we have some convex function, let's call it f. And we're optimizing over x in some polytope d. And the way that Frank Wolf works is, recall, you start off by saying, which is the best vertex? Which vertex <coughs> minimizes my convex objective? And once I've done that, I repeat three steps. I say, OK, wherever I'm at right now, whatever x I'm at right now, let's construct the tangent hyperplane to f at that x. So that's this thing in brown. Now we're going to use that tangent hyperplane as a stand-in for the convex function. We're going to optimize over that tangent hyperplane, but optimizing a hyperplane over a polytope is straightforward. We know it's going to be one of the vertices. And then finally, we do a line search between our existing point and that vertex. And so remember, we started at a vertex. So then we do a convex combination with another vertex on the first step. We do a convex combination with another vertex on the second step, and so on. And in general, after m minus 1 steps, our answer will be a convex combination of m vertices. So it turns out we can express our objective over w as a convex function. We can set up our polytope so that each vertex is in fact a data point. And therefore we can apply Frank Wolf directly to this problem. And when we do that, we get some pretty nice theory that now, after m iterations, we don't even have a high probability bound anymore, we just have a bound. In fact, we have a geometrically decreasing bound now in the error because alpha will be greater than 1. So that term is going to dominate. And this looks pretty good. This looks like a much better rate than what we had before. But of course, we also want to check that this is what we see in practice. OK, so let's do that. Let's look at some, some problems using corsets. First one we're going to do is Gaussian Gaussian conjugate model. Why a conjugate model? We don't need approximate inference for that, because we want to isolate what's the effect of the corset approximation from you know, your usual approximate Bayesian inference in MCMC, VB, et cetera. And so to do that, let's look at this Gaussian-Gaussian conjugate model. We have 1,000 data points, those little points in gray. We uniformly subsample five data points in black. The exact posterior predicted mean and three sigma region is in blue. For the uniform subsamples, we get an approximation in green, and we do it 50 times. And man, is it all over the place for a really simple problem. Of course, it gets better as we uniformly subsample more points, but again, that's not the point. We think for such a simple problem, there's a very simple answer. We should just summarize with the middle data point. OK, same thing with important sampling. It's all over the place. And now let's look at Frank Wolf. Again, we're running 50 times. 
It's just you can't tell the difference between our approximations and the ground truth in blue. And that's because Frank Wolf is doing the right thing. It's picking out this nice central point here, or a very nice central point, and just giving it a really high weight. And that is a great corset of size one. And of course, it gets better as we increase the number of corset points. But we want, kind of want it to be really good, really fast. OK, so this is uh, this conjugate model. Let's look at Bayesian logistic regression, which is what we were talking about earlier. So here, we have uniform subsampling. This is exactly the same set of plots that we saw before. Same thing with important sampling, exactly the same set of plots from a previous slide. But now we try Frank Wolf. And again, we see that the noise in our 50 runs is lower than the noise in our 50 runs for m equals 1,000 when we were sampling. A couple of other things, or one, one big thing I want to point out here too is that somehow it's automatically picking up the structure of the problem. Somehow the task that you're doing should be important to how you summarize the data. Imagine that you had a classroom of a thousand people and you wanted to summarize them for how well they're going to do in a test. And maybe, you know, 900, 90 of them studied and 10 of them didn't. That's probably the right way to summarize. But now you want to summarize them for, you know, some medical outcome. And maybe, you know, 10 of them had the flu and 990 of them didn't. And that's probably going to be a different summary. So somehow the task should really matter. And what we're seeing here is that we're picking out this point sort of perpendicular to the dividing line. Something I want to point out that can be a little bit misleading about just looking at this is that it's hard to plot 10,000 data points. You can just easily get a big sort of smudge of red and blue. And so we're making them very light. And so there's actually quite a few data points all around this edge, and that might just be hard to see. We're picking out this point that's sort of perpendicular to the dividing line, giving it a big weight, and then sort of filling in the dividing line, as you might expect. Okay, we see this in a number of other problems. Things like Poisson regression and spherical clustering are in the paper. I'll encourage you to check them out. Now, a big point that we haven't covered yet, and you should be very concerned about, is that Frank Wolf is presumably going to take a lot more time to run than uniform subsampling is. And that should count, right? Because it's not just about being fast after we get the points. It's about being fast in the total pipeline. So here we're plotting the total CPU time in a log scale versus error in a log scale. We look at a number of different data sets, including a fishing data set. For each data set, the way that we create this line is by increasing the number of core set points, either for uniform subsampling or Frank Wolf. So we get more accurate as we have more core set points. Uniform subsampling is red and Frank Wolf is gold. You see that Frank Wolf is sort of orders of magnitude better later, but for a small number of core set points, because it takes so long to run, it's about just as good as uniform subsampling. And so it turns out that actually Frank Wolf has some problems in optimization that we can be a bit more careful about getting around. We can um, use a different optimization algorithm that we call greedy iterative geodesic ascent, um, but it's still the same core set framework that I described with the Hilbert norm and everything. But by doing this, we can get orders of magnitude better performance, even for a low number of core set points. OK, so just to summarize, um, we've been talking about data summarization, in particular this idea of a filtered <coughs> core set, to get scalable methods that are automated. So automated in the sense that you can just give me a new likelihood, and we can immediately apply this method. And we get error bounds on the output quality that we care about, these point estimates and uncertainties for finite data, because that's the interesting part about Bayesian inference is the posterior that we, we have. So I want to make two points. So one is um, data summarization doesn't have to just be core sets. It could be other things. We've explored this idea of um, <clears throat> instead of having a sufficient statistic, which you often don't have in complex models, how about an approximate sufficient statistic? In fact, we do this with polynomials. And we can run on a real industry data set of 6 million data points with 1,000 features using 22 cores and just 16 seconds in that case. Also, I think this point where we got much better performance with Giga suggests that you know, we're not done here, that there are a lot of other things that we could do that we could be a little bit smarter about with the optimization that would give even further better performance. OK, so if you're interested in the ideas from today's talk, let me first point you to the main paper that I covered, this automated scalable Bayesian inference via Hilbert Corsets. This sets up this nice Hilbert Corsets framework that I've been talking about. If you're interested in the orders of magnitude improvement, greedy iterative geodesic ascent, that's GIGA, and that's in this ICML paper over here from 2018. We had a first paper on core sets that wasn't quite as sort of broad-based and automated and generally applicable with the same bounds, but it was a great first foray. So that's this one down here. And if you're interested in approximate sufficient statistics, um, that appeared uh, over here. And then I just want to mention 
uh, that this isn't necessarily just for Bayesian inference. Uh, so in fact, we've applied this to reducing the size of random feature maps in kernel learning. Um, and you can see that paper on the archive up here. Thank you. <laughs> Can we go back to the uh, nice uh, circles? Yeah. So, okay. If I so if, if I have this right, because this is you have exact conjugacy. So you don't have conjugacy. So you have conjugacy in the Gaussian Gaussian model that I had before, but this one we are running on CNC. Okay. Is it still true that if I only had ten data points? the kind of correct posterior would look more or less like the uniform. So, you know, the correct posterior would be extremely different in all these cases. So something I, I want to be really clear about is that the noise that we're looking at here is not like posterior noise, like that's a different type of noise. This is just bad estimation noise. This is like we are trying to estimate the exact posterior mean and we're getting it wrong. This isn't, you know, these aren't draws from an exact posterior, which is what you might be expecting in a talk today. Um, but that's not what I'm showing. But so I mean I don't I guess I don't you, can you give me a sense of what for ten samples one hundred samples have yeah so for so something I, I actually want to emphasize as well so I I'm not going to be able to draw you what the posterior looks like for ten samples one hundred samples a thousand samples I wouldn't think that it would necessarily be based on anything that you're seeing on this slide this is really just the means but I do want to emphasize that it is different in each of those cases that if you actually had ten or a hundred or a thousand actual data points that the posterior would be different from the one with 10,000. And so that's why you have to have the upweighting or something like that, that we are trying to represent the posterior for the actual 10,000 data points that we have. Okay. Uh, so I might have missed something basic. So if you want to choose a subset of the data, as you said, it depends on, on the form of the likelihood function. That's unknown because the parameters are unknown. So do you have to interleave the data? No, yeah, so this is, this is a great point. So something that um, is hard to convey in 30 minutes, but let me, let me suggest now is you actually have to, to calculate or estimate, in this case, um, this norm, and in particular this norm for different data points. And so we do that, and that's included in the total time cost that I showed you. In our case, we use a Laplace approximation to make that approximation and then estimate that norm. So the, the nature of a weighted fish information distance, which is the norm that's used in the experiments, is that it's an expectation over some weighting. So that's why it's weighted, because it's not going to be the exact posterior. Um, of some difference between gradients of the exact and approximating posterior, which boils down to, because the priors are the same, gradients between the exact and approximating log likelihoods. So the main issue that arises is that expectation. You could use a prior, you're still gonna get a bound. You could use a Laplace, you could use some other approximation. The bound will be better as that gets close to the actual posterior, but of course we don't have access to the actual posterior. And so in some sense, we're bootstrapping our way to that actual posterior, but that's where the big computation comes in. I see, so for, for deep nonlinear models, computing the Laplace approximation is pretty hard, so. Yeah, yeah, so it's interesting to think what type of approximation would be appropriate there. Also, it might be that a different type of norm could be used. So all of the these results, this type of result, is agnostic to the norm. It's just a norm that we chose in our approximations, but I think that would be interesting to think about, yeah. Thank, I, I think you, you partially replied to my question. Um, basically, so this is like of any kind of norm, right? Here. Yeah, yeah, so, so any, as long as you have a Hilbert norm here, your, our, our theory in this part will hold. The part where you might consider choosing specific types of norms is that you want to get some kind of bound on, for instance, posterior means, posterior variances, or whatever it is you care about. And then you'll have to think about what norm gives you those bounds. This weighted Fisher information that we explored does give you those bounds. That's not to say it's the best way to get them. It's just okay. a way. So and it, it, there is no assumption whatsoever on the likelihood is there? Right now, so right now, yeah. there isn't, I mean, this is pretty general, um, but as soon as you start choosing an exact norm, then you're going to need some assumptions probably to calculate that. Okay. Yeah. So it's like separating it into two theoretical parts. Okay. So, uh, question. so uh, how do you make the choice? Like now it is uh, every model dependent. So you have a different likelihood. Oh, oh, oh. Everything. Yeah, so, so yeah, I want to emphasize how this is how this is automated. So so once you've chosen a norm, like a weight of information norm, 
you can just plug in whatever your next likelihood is and go. Like you don't have to, um, you don't have to re-derive anything for a new model. So this is this is like in the flavor of nuts, where like, oh, you know, this is actually, you know, probably pretty complicated to go ahead and code, but it's something that could be encoded as part of uh, probabilistic programming language. Okay. So how, how different are these uh, present sets? Like, because I'm thinking like for the same data sets, like we probably yeah. have the very similar core sets for all different body parts. So, so actually it is pretty different based on the model. So for instance, so a really easy way to see that it's really going to depend on what you're trying to do um, is exactly this illustration. So let's say that you wanted to do k-means clustering on this data, you would obviously get extremely different core set points. Like you would expect the core sets to be something like the centers of the clusters. And I think that this illustrates that you really do want a different summary for different tasks that you won't get if you want optimal performance at the end. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions? Yeah. So I, I, I guess I, I want to check, my, like, if I had access to the true likely, like the infinite data likelihood function, yeah. would the correct weights be the true, like the, the weights of those data points under the true likelihood? Um, so no, so, so, so suppose, for instance, that you could calculate these norms exactly. You'd still be making an approximation because you're approximating your true total log likelihood with this sort of summary log likelihood. So even if you could calculate every norm, every likelihood, everything exactly, then you'd still be making this approximation here, and so there would still be some, some difference. But it's not true that the, the way you get the types of approximation in general is to use the true, if you had access to like the oracle likelihoods. So well, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you do have access to the likelihoods in this case, but, but that wouldn't make sense to use as weights because you sort of have like, for instance, in the case of 10,000 data points, or you know, let's say a billion data points, you have likelihoods for every one of those data points, but now you want to just pick out 10 data points and give them weights. And so those weights aren't just going to be likelihoods, they're going to be some weight that depends on where all the other data points are, et cetera. Maybe it's maybe it's hidden in this norm, or I don't understand. But the, for Bayesian non-parametrics, does this also hold, or does the model the number of parameters need to stay constant? One? Yeah, you have to be a little bit careful with Bayesian non-parametrics. So I think that it's relatively straightforward for something like if you were looking at a Dirichlet process, because actually the likelihood isn't kind of the thing that's infinite; it's the prior, um, and so it's like a nice way to go around it. But for Gaussian processes, you have to be a little bit more careful because there really is somehow an infinity in there. And does it still work? Um, I I I suspect, but I think you have to. You probably have to think about it a little bit more. It's something that we're thinking about a little bit, but your thinking might be better than our thinking, so I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, I, I feel more comfortable saying that if you have a, a finite parameter, that you can go ahead and do this very very easily and very straightforwardly. Beyond that, it's probably a little bit more thinking that has to go up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh,